If we want to reintegrate our ancient past with the present, if we want to revive biblical religion in a manner that's honest, the place to begin is Genesis 1. ויום אל אלוהים, יהי רקיע בתוך המים, ויהי מבדיל בין מים למים, ויעש אלוהים את הרקיע, ויבדל בין המים אשר מתחת לרקיע, ובין המים אשר מעל לרקיע, ויהי כן. And God said, let there be a rakia, a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it separate water from water. And God made the firmament and separated between the waters which are below the firmament and the waters which are above the firmament. And it was so. And God called the rakia heavens, and it was evening and it was morning, a second day. In my last video, I argued that Old Testament cosmology describes a flat earth with a dome-shaped covering overhead called a rakia. The function of this firmament was to retain a celestial ocean. The ancient Near Eastern concept being that our world exists inside a cosmic bubble, surrounded on all sides by watery chaos. In response, many of you have sent me this 2011 Seminary Journal article challenging this consensus by Yonker and Davidson. It's entitled The Myth of the Solid Heavenly Dome. In the interest of presenting some of the evidence for my position, I'm going to interact with a couple of their arguments. It's significant that Genesis 1-1 opens in the genre of Mesopotamian syntax because we possess a Mesopotamian creation myth which relates a conceptually similar account to the creation of the heavens in Genesis. Wayne Horowitz's book, Mesopotamian Cosmic Geography, is a comprehensive field standard on Babylonian cosmology. He writes, Explicit statements that the heavens are made of water are found in Babylonian texts. Examples include Enuma Elish, Tablet 4, lines 137 through 146, where Marduk builds the heavens out of the watery corpse of Tiamat, where the Akkadian name for heaven, Same, is explained as Same, of water. This is similar to the Hebrew word for heaven, Shemaim, which is likely a contraction for Shammaim, which literally means water there. In a new Elish tablet 4, lines 139 through 40, Marduk stretches out the chaos dragon's skin and assigns guards to keep the waters of heaven from draining downwards into the lower regions of the universe. These traditions may be compared with Genesis 1, where the primeval waters are divided in two, with the upper waters positioned above the firmament, Rakia. Now, Yonker and Davidson deny the existence of a heavenly ocean retained by the sky in Israelite cosmology. They want to interpret the waters above in these passages as mere clouds. They provide three arguments for this identification on pages 143 through 144, under the heading Waters Above, as follows. Argument 1. Quote, the mention of the waters, which are above me'al, the expanse, in verse 7, is very likely a reference to clouds. This interpretation is supported by intertextual parallels to Genesis 1 and other Old Testament creation accounts. Note especially Proverbs 8.28, where what exists above me'al, the sky or heavens, shemaim, is explicitly described as the clouds, shechakim. Rebuttal. A Semitist friend and I were a bit frustrated with this claim because, as you can see, it's not apparent in the text at all, and they offer no further explanation of how they derive this conclusion. Perhaps they are trying to say that the circle on the face of the deep in line B of verse 27 refers to the sky, and since line A of the next verse says, when he established the clouds above, they therefore believe the object of above is the sky. Several problems. First. 27b is synonymous with a verse in Job 26.10, which defines the inscribed circle on the waters as the horizon formed by the heavenly dome. This is why translations like the NET, NIV, or HCSB, afraid that readers will be confused, go ahead and translate circle here as horizon. Andrew Steinman, professor of Hebrew at Concordia University, agrees. See also Michael V. Fox, professor emeritus of Semitics at Wisconsin-Madison. The implication, therefore, would be that the clouds are above the circumscription where the sky meets the waters, not above the sky itself. But even granting that much in the argument would be excessively generous, considering in the 27 other occurrences of Mime'al in the Bible, or its parallel contraction Mitachat, which appears 48 other times, these are never syntactically separated by their object by a sof pasuk, as this proposed reading would require. The syntax doesn't work. But I assume this would have been obvious to Yonker and Davidson. So the alternative is that they therefore must be trying to say that Genesis 1 describes the creation of the sky, and Proverbs 8 here describes the creation of the sky. So the fact that Proverbs 8 mentions clouds being above, next to its account of the sky's creation, indicates that we can retroject that understanding back into Genesis 1. 
defining its waters above as clouds. There are several problems with this argument. First, as I've stated, the passage doesn't at all indicate that these clouds are above the sky itself, but the collocative formula of mima al with clouds assumes that they are above with respect to the speaker's perspective. Excluding this verse, this similar collocation with heavens or clouds or God who is in heaven with mima al accounts for 42% of the 26 occurrences of the term in passages like Deuteronomy 5.8, Isaiah 45.13, or especially Psalm 78.23. The author probably just wants to emphasize that these clouds are up in the sky to satisfy the A-B aesthetic of the poem, which switches from the deep below to the heavens above. Second, so many of the elements in this poem aren't parallel in specified form in Genesis 1, like the creation of the depths, the mountains, fields, dust, or the fountains of the deep, that the texts aren't conceptually synonymous enough in either their topical elements or general literary structure to serve as strong evidence that the waters above and the clouds are identical. Third, and this is really the Sockdologer in my opinion, read Genesis 1, 6 through 7 closely, step by step. It says the Rakia formed, quote, in the midst of the waters, betoch hamayim, not over them, but within them. Then, as the Rakia separated from the waters under it, the oceanic waters that were initially above it remained above it. The fact that the Rakia initially starts in the midst of the primeval sea with waters already under it and over it shows that when the author says the waters are above the Rakia as the final resulting action of their separation, he means this literally, as in the initial phase. Not only are clouds never described as existing above the sky or Rakia in the Bible, but it's exegetically inconsistent to switch from a literal interpretation at the start of the creation sequence, then interpret that same concomitant resulting state as some sort of weird Hebrew figurative statement in the second part of that sequence. The initial state defines the waters above as literal. What I've just explained is the reason why guys like Maimonides or Martin Luther refuse to accept the cloud interpretation. Here's Luther, for example, who wasn't a mean Hebraist. But what is most remarkable is that Moses clearly makes three divisions. He places the firmament in the middle, between the waters. I might readily imagine that the firmament is the uppermost mass of all, and that the waters which are in suspension, not over but under the heaven, are the clouds which we observe, so that the waters separated from our waters on earth. But Moses says in plain words that the waters were above and below the firmament. I here therefore take my reason captive, and subscribe to the word of God even though I do not understand it. The plain meaning of the Hebrew text was so clear to Luther that he even pulled in answers in Genesis, and rebuked people who were inclined to interpret them figuratively, to accord with the mainstream science of his day. Quote, We Christians must be different from the philosophers, in the way that we think about the causes of things. If some things are beyond our comprehension like those before us concerning the waters above the heavens, we must believe them rather than wickedly deny them, or presumptuously interpret them in conformity with our understanding. Argument 2. Yonker and Davidson's second argument for identifying the waters above the heavens with clouds is a single sentence long. Psalm 78.23 likewise describes the clouds above. Rebuttal. Psalm 78.23 does say that there are clouds above, but again, it's pretty transparent that the thing that they are above is not the sky in this passage, but the perspective of the speaker. Quote, Yet he gave a command of the clouds above, and opened the doors of heavens. He rained down manna for the people to eat, he gave them the grain of heaven. Also, I'm afraid lay readers might be inclined to overinterpret the fact that the same contraction is used here as with waters above. Understand, this doesn't indicate much by way of evidence because all Ayin Lamed is the most generic Hebrew word for above. Even its contraction, Ma'al, occurs over 140 times in the Bible. Argument 3. Yonker and Davidson object that the biblical authors were aware that rain derives from clouds, so it's superfluous to propose that they additionally believed in a celestial ocean above the sky. Rebuttal. Obviously, anyone with eyes in the ancient world was aware that rain falls from clouds. That still didn't stop, for example, the ancient Babylonians or Egyptians, from additionally adhering to belief in a celestial ocean. I'll address those in my own positive case, but I want to focus first on remnants of ancient Near Eastern cosmology and post-Hellenistic Jewish literature. Here's a passage about the men of Babel from 3rd Baruch, chapter 3, verses 6 through 8, written in the first few centuries after Christ. Quote, and appearing to them, the Lord changed their languages. By that time, they had built the tower 463 cubits high. 
and taking an auger, they attempted to pierce the heaven, saying, Let us see whether the heaven is made of clay, or copper, or iron. Seeing these things, God did not permit them to continue, but struck them with blindness and confusion of tongues. Yonker and Davidson claim that this text is probably referring to the Greek model of hard crystalline spheres, and not retaining tradition of an ancient Near Eastern solid dome. Perhaps, it's true that the Greeks did believe in a series of solid firmaments, but this same tradition occurs in the Babylonian Talmud, Sanhedrin 109a, where the rabbis tell us that the scheming men of Babel said, quote, Let us build a tower, ascend to heaven and cleave it with axes, that its waters might gush forth. This seems to retain the heavenly waters above as an element of the tradition. Another passage that Yonker and Davidson don't mention that assumes a solid sky and explicitly alludes to its heavenly ocean can be found in a text called Bereshit Rabbah, compiled during Judaism's classical period between 8300 and 500. The thickness of the firmament equals that of the earth, compare. It is he that sitteth above the chug of the earth, Isaiah 40:22, with, and he walketh in the chug of the heaven, Job 22:14. The use of hug in both verses teaches that they are alike. Rabbi Aha said in Rabbi Jenina's name, It is as thick as a metal plate. Rabbi Joshua, son of Rabbi Nehemiah, said, It is about two fingers in thickness. The son of Pazi said, The upper waters exceed the lower ones by about the measure of thirty extus, for it is written, And let the firmament divide the waters from the waters. Our rabbis said, They are half and half, that is, equal. Besides debating the thickness of the firmament in the Bible, some of the rabbis speculated that the heavenly ocean above it was equal in volume to the earth's oceans. Because the Genesis 1-6 phrase, divide waters from waters, tends to imply a half-and-half -half separation. The same half-and-half -half separation is derived in the Dead Sea Scroll Book of Jubilees. Notice how the author explains this in the same way that I did earlier. And on the second day he created the firmament in the midst of the waters, and the waters were divided on that day. Half of them went up above, and half of them went down below the firmament. J. Edward Wright is professor of Hebrew Bible and early Judaism at the University of Arizona. In his book The Early History of Heaven, he quotes 2 Enoch 3.3, The angels placed me on the first heaven, and showed me a very great sea, even greater than the earthly sea. According to Wright, quote, This is the celestial ocean, believed since ancient times to be just above the atmosphere. This text thus incorporates the ancient Near Eastern traditions about the celestial ocean into the Greco-Roman multiple heaven model. A similar statement appears in the Testament of Levi, chapter 1, verses 8 through 10 among the Dead Sea scriptures. Quote, and I entered from the first heaven, and there I saw a great sea hanging. We have no shortage of early Jewish texts that assume the heavens are a solid dome. For example, Pesachim 94b of the Babylonian Talmud, which talks about how the quote, sages of Israel, argued with the Romans about whether night is created because the sun travels behind the wall of the firmament, or whether it is created by the sun traveling under the earth, the sages of Israel maintaining the former. The Palestinian Talmud even postulates a system of 365 windows in the perimeter of the dome that the sun travels through to make this possible. If you're interested in more texts on this topic, there's a free online journal article by the rabbinic scholar Moshe Simon Shoshan at Bar Ilan University, in which he cites three additional texts where the rabbis taught that the firmament was formed of solidified water. But my main point is that this heavenly ocean idea was maintained even into Hellenistic Judaism, despite the fact that its adherents knew rain derived from clouds. An excellent illustration is in Bereshit Rabbah 13.10. Here the rabbis record arguments between them and the Roman view about the sources of the rains. The Romans believed clouds drew their water from the sea. Ancient Jews weren't stupid, they knew about evaporation. But an indigenous Jewish view related through Rabbi Joshua likewise maintained that, quote, The earth drinks from the upper waters, for it is written, and it drinketh water as the rain of heaven cometh down, Deuteronomy 11.11. 11. The clouds, however, mount up to heaven and receive them, as if from the mouth of a bottle, for it is written, they gather up water into its cloud. According to Simon Shoshan, quote, This would seem to be the mainstream position among the rabbis, as it is often referred to elsewhere in rabbinic literature without challenge. For example, Bereshit Rabbah 4.3 and 4.4. So Yonker and Davidson's argument that the mere awareness of clouds and evaporation would have extruded belief in a celestial ocean for ancient man? isn't supported by ancient Near Eastern or early rabbinic thought. Simon Shoshan's study concludes that although they were aware of and sometimes influenced by Greek views, 
Quote, the rabbi's view of the nature and structure of the heavens closely parallels ancient Near Eastern perceptions on the matter, both in its broader conception and many of its details. Though the rabbi's main source was certainly the Bible, they very likely had indirect access to other ancient Near Eastern traditions about the heavens. Several of the rabbi's ideas about the heavens that have no source in the Bible have presence in various Mesopotamian sources. Now having addressed Yonker and Davidson's three arguments from this section, here are five positive arguments for rejecting their identification of the waters above with clouds. 1. As noted, the initial state of Genesis 1-6 with the firmament, quote, in the midst of the waters, defines the resulting separation with waters maintained above as literal. To take the cloud interpretation, you have to define the initial state as literal, then inconsistently define its immediate resulting action in the next verse as figurative. 2. The figurative interpretation is ad hoc, because there is no passage in the Bible which directly describes clouds as above the sky. 3. Plenty of ancient Jewish sources describe a celestial ocean retained by a vault of heaven, which the rabbis cited from the Bible as their own tradition in distinction from the various theories of the Greeks. Yonker and Davidson's proposal would imply that the biblical authors had a superior comprehension of astronomy than post-Hellenistic Jews. 4. Genesis 1.17 opens saying that God, quote, set the celestial bodies, quote, in the rakia. Since the waters above are specified as, quote, above the rakia, just ten verses over in Genesis 1.7, identifying clouds at the waters above would imply that the author of Genesis thought clouds were more distant than the sun, moon, and stars. Why does the Bible specify these waters as being above the rakia as opposed to set in the rakia, like the sun, moon, and stars? The cosmological layering in Genesis is the opposite of what Yonker and Davidson's theory predicts. And 5. Their argument violates the whole contextual matrix offered by the civilization surrounding ancient Israel. Let's look at that last point. Start with Egypt to Israel's west. We know archaeologically that there was significant trade between Egypt and the Levant for centuries, particularly spiking in the period preceding the exile. J. Edward Wright at the University of Arizona points out that the Egyptian texts also mention these heavenly waters frequently. One hymn calls them the Nile in heaven, a hymn to Ra calls them the watery abyss of the sky, a coffin text calls them the celestial waters, and quote, the pool of the firmament. Here's a quote from James P. Allen previous president of the International Association of Egyptologists and professor of Egyptology at Brown University. Looking at the sky without telescopes, the Egyptians saw only an undifferentiated background of blue by day or black by night, the same qualities visible in the River Nile. Understandably, therefore, the Egyptians concluded that the sky, like the Nile, was composed of water. The waters of the sky were thought to surround the earth and extend infinitely outwards in all directions. The world existed in a single void inside this endless sea. By day, the sun sailed across the surface of the sky ocean. Fundamentally, the concept of the world as a cosmic void within a universal ocean remained consistent and essentially unchanged throughout three millennia of recorded ancient Egyptian history. Indeed, the name of the Egyptian goddess of the sky, Nut, even means watery one, being etymologically related to the name of the watery abyss, Nu. Now look to Israel's north in Hatti. What do we find? They taught that heaven was split from the earth originally by the gods with a copper tool, and was upheld by an atlas god, Upeluri. This language of heaven being split from the earth is nearly universal in creation myths. For example, in the opening of the Sumerian text called Gilgamesh in the Netherworld. When we look to Israel's east, we find artifacts like the Babylonian unfinished Kaduru stone. According to Egyptologists Uthmar Kiel and Sylvia Schroer, and Kiel is considered a world-leading scholar in ancient Near Eastern iconography, the chaotic waters of the deep are symbolized by the great dragon coiled around its base. But another corresponding serpent, quote, encloses the peak of the entirety. The two serpents symbolize the upper and lower oceans. On the level directly under the heavenly waters are, quote, the symbols of the gods that can be recognized in the constellations, end quote. With the middle register depicting the earth in a procession of worship, and the register beneath that depicting the fortress walls of the city of the underworld. It's the classic three-tier cosmology of the ancient Near East. Iconographically, scholars like Kiel and Walton also point us to the tablet of Shamesh. In this case, the inscription tells us point-blank that the gods are sitting above the watery Apsu, which is depicted above a firmament embedded with stars. 
Even the Babylonian map of the world of the British Museum depicts the world with its horizon terminating at the rim of the eight cosmic mountains as a disk, according to its curator Irving Finkel. Similar to how Yonker and Davidson's own biblical proof text describes the quote, circle on the face of the deep, or we read of Isaiah describing God sitting over the compass and scribe quote, circle of the earth. For example, besides textual parallels, Kiel points us to a 4th century BC sarcophagus from the necropolis of Saqqara. Then there's the textual parallel in Enuma Elish. Recall, Enuma Elish is Babylonian, and most scholars still maintain that Genesis 1 was edited around the time of the Babylonian exile. In that text, a central theme of the myth is how Marduk stretches out the upper half of time at to seal out her waters so that there will be a cosmic void where the Earth can exist. As an aside, young Earthers like Jason Lyle in his book Taking Back Astronomy keep using the argument that the Bible anticipates redshift theory and the expansion of the universe because it frequently says, quote, God stretches out the heavens. The problem with this argument is that the Babylonian creation myth also says Marduk stretched out the heavens, with similar tent language. The Akkadian verb is isdud. Were the priests of Marduk receiving divinely inspired astrophysical revelations too? In short, the ancient Near East already provides full and sufficient basis for interpreting the waters above, so we don't need to invent ad hoc explanations motivated by modern astronomy. I also have beef with the half of their article that conducts a historical survey of astronomy. Citing some historical surveys, they write, quote, The idea that the ancient Hebrews believed the heavens consisted of a solid vault resting on a flat earth appears to have emerged for the first time only during the early 19th century, when introduced as part of the flat earth concept introduced by Washington Irving and Antoine Jean Latron. First, early Jewish texts like Bereshit Rabbah Parashah 4 Midrash 5, or the Palestinian Talmud, are clear defeaters for this assertion. Citing their own Bibles, rabbinic Jews point-blank articulate a belief in a solid vault. And the flat earth part of their conclusion doesn't even make sense to me either. We know the Egyptians believed in a flat earth. They drew it. Their myths describing the emergence of the primordial hill assume it. We also have a drawing of the Babylonian flat earth, and every scholar of Babylonian astronomy I've read acknowledges that they had no concept of a spherical cosmology. For example, J. Edward Wright agrees, quote, all Babylonian astronomy presupposed a flat Earth and either did not recognize or ignored the influence of latitude on celestial observation. For that matter, the Neo-Assyrian Etana legend assumes it's flat when it describes the Earth as a disk, surrounded as if by a circular irrigation ditch. Do you really think that Daniel didn't share Nebuchadnezzar's view of a flat Earth in Daniel 4 when they were both interacting with the Mesopotamian world tree legend? Do you really think ancient Northwest Semitic culture was the only outlier among the nations contiguous with them, and that they believed the Earth was a globe, with people living upside-down lives on the opposite side prevented from flying off by some invisible force? This traditional cosmology of the Middle East seems to be the reason why a good number of Eastern Church Fathers and the Antiochian School of Exegesis insisted on maintaining literal interpretations of Genesis 1's cosmology against Hellenistic cosmology up into the Islamic period. And I bring this one up because it's omitted from the historical surveys Yonker and Davidson's own survey relies on. The Yale philologist Kevin Von Blattel has published a paper in the Bulletin of the School of Oriental and African Studies, in which he shows how 6th and 7th century Syrian Christian cosmology provides contextual background for why the Quran and Hadiths propound a flat earth, with the sun setting in a spring of water. For example, according to Euthemios Nicoladius, an Athenian historian of Byzantium, John Christosom, one of the most prolific authors in the early church and the Archbishop of Constantinople, the capital of the Byzantine Empire, held a, quote, cosmology that was simple, a flat earth covered by a single heaven in the form of a vault. For John, heaven is immobile, in it the stars move and their movements serve to determine time. Von Bladel, Nicolaitis, and the Princeton professor of church history Kathleen McVeigh also point to figures like Mar Abba the Great, the head bishop of the Assyrian Church of the East. There's also Narsai, the head of his own school and foremost writer in the Assyrian Church of the East. There's also Diodorus, the 4th century bishop of Tarsus, who thought spherical cosmology was a denial of scripture and would usher in atheism. There's Theodore, Bishop of Mopsuesta, who is the greatest representative of the Antiochian school of exegesis. Severin, the Bishop of Gabala in Syria, who published six vehement sermons against spherical cosmology. There's also figures like Cyril, the 4th century Bishop of Jerusalem, 
who took elements of this traditional cosmology quite seriously, and, of course, Cosmos Indicoplestis, the 6th century Syrian trained churchman, who published his now infamous work Christian Topography, which vehemently argued for a flat earth cosmology from the Bible. You'll notice these guys are all operating in the Middle East, by the way. Finally, it is true as Yonker and Davidson emphasized that Greek philosophers began formulating a spherical earth around the 6th century, but even they shared the ancient Near Eastern view originally. Adams tells us that Homer pictured the earth, quote, as a circular flat disk, surrounded by the great river ocean. The Greeks conceived it, quote, as a bowl-like hemisphere, covering a flat earth. Seeley likewise cites five other classical scholars who agree that among Homer and Hesiod, quote, the sky is a solid hemisphere-like bowl, covering the flat round earth. And this conception is also found in figures like Thales, Synaximander, or Exophanes of Colophon. According to Simon Shoshan, quote, The cosmology that emerges from these texts is thus remarkably similar to, and was likely influenced by, the ancient Near Eastern cosmological model, end quote. So to propose that, say, 8th century Judeans like Isaiah believed in a spherical earth is not only anachronistic by the standards of all their neighboring civilizations, but the Ionians in the north hadn't even advanced that far at the time. To conclude, I don't think Yonker and Davidson's article has refuted the consensus view. I get that the position that I'm defending here scares a lot of conservatives because it doesn't conform with the popular articulation of biblical inspiration that's usually taught. If that's you and you're wondering how to sort this out theologically, I'll recommend this lecture by a conservative Semitist who taught Hebrew at Liberty University and works for Logos Bible Software. It'll get you up to speed on the biblical material dealing with cosmology. But more importantly, it'll also help you sort out the implications in a way that I think will enhance your respect for the Bible rather than diminish it. Frankly, I'm sick of seeing the church distort the Bible and trying to make it into something it was never intended to be, to fit in with modern science.